In this lesson today, we're going to be talking about lives worth reproducing. And as children of God and disciples of Jesus Christ, our lives are worth reproducing. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So several years ago, I was uh, preaching a camp meeting in the state of Illinois, and a total stranger walked up to me after I had preached two or three services, and he said, have you ever heard of a missionary named Kenny Cantrell? Well, what he didn't know was that 25 years ago, I had met Kenny Cantrell. He came to our church. He'd been raised in an apostolic church, but he never got saved. We built a relationship with him. Uh, after five Bible studies, he asked me if he could be baptized. And the next Sunday, he ran to the altar during the middle of my message, lifted his hands. You could see the Holy Spirit come on him. God filled him with the Holy Ghost right there in front of the entire congregation. And so he was, a, uh, he was a manager of a sporting goods store, uh, one of the top stores in the country. So I thought, hmm, manager, successful store, maybe he's a good leader. So I got him on my leadership team. He then came on my pastoral staff. The only mistake I made was when I took him with me on a mission to Africa. And Africa got into him. And so today, Ken and Jenny Cantrell are doing a fabulous job in making disciples in Burkina Faso, West Africa. Well, this guy didn't know this backstory of Kenny Cantrell. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to play a little dumb and see what he says. So I said, Cantrell, yeah, it kind of rings a bell. Why do you ask? He said, well, I've been listening to you preach for three services now, and you preach a whole lot like Kenny Cantrell. And I wanted to say, dude, he didn't get awesome all by himself, you know. And so I would like to think that in my lifetime, that I've got my fingerprints on somebody. Our lives are worth reproducing. So who is going to have your fingerprints on their life? Welcome to our small group video series entitled, Follow to Lead, The Journey of a Disciple Maker. And this is session two. Today we want to talk about how to live our lives intentionally, and more specifically, a life worth reproducing. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 in the New King James, imitate me as I imitate Christ. When you study the New Testament and you read the New Testament through the lens of a disciple maker, we realize that this idea of imitation is all through the narrative of the New Testament. So our lives are worth reproducing. And this is the essence of disciple making. Me leading my disciple, but that's not the end game. The end game is, is that my disciple will then turn around and begin leading their disciple. So I want to ask a question today in your local church. What are the expectations that are placed upon the members of the congregation? Is it simply to just live good lives? Is the expectation is that we'll just, you know, get sin out of people's lives and that they'll come to church and, you know, sing in the choir and pay their tithes and you know, become more than a CEO, a Christmas and Easter only Christian? Is that our expectations? I think one of the difference between the 21st century church and the first century church is that the expectations are much different. In the first century, in the language of disciples, the expectation was to sacrifice everything, to take up your cross, to forsake all other relationships. This doesn't sound much like the 21st century church. In the 21st century church, we have lots of options. But in the first century church, they didn't have any options. If you wanted to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you had to have a cross. Because Jesus said, unless you take up your cross and follow me, uh, you cannot be my disciple. And so there's a major difference, I think, 
in how we live our lives today and how they lived their lives in the first century. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2 that the first century believers were daily in the temple and in every house. So this basically describes corporate worship daily in the temple and private living and worship and in every house. In the first century, they had no dedicated ministry space. You know, there was no welcome center in the church. There was no Sunday school classroom. There was no ushers and greeters area. There was no choir loft. There was no pulpit. They didn't have this literal square footage where they did ministry space. They did ministry everywhere they went, daily in the temple and in every house. They ceased not to preach and teach Jesus Christ. So we're talking about what are the expectations of the members of your church. I think one of the things that will help us is that if we consider redefining what it means to be spiritually mature. Let me give you an example of this in Mark chapter 11. When the Bible says Jesus came by a fig tree that was by the wayside, this means that it was not in the vineyard. It Perhaps a seed had you know, blown off a tree and fell in a crack somewhere a hundred feet away. So this was sort of a rogue fig tree. And Jesus comes to it because it has leaves and he's expecting to uh, the tree to bear fruit. And when he searches the leaves but he finds no fruit, the Bible says that he cursed the tree. Now I got to tell you that my whole life when I've read that story, it sort of upset me and I've had a bone to pick with Jesus about that. Well, well you know, the Bible even says that the time of figs was not yet. And so I want to say, Jesus, why would you curse the fig tree? But the answer is very simple. When you study the fig trees, especially those that grow in, in uh, the nation of Israel, the leaves and the figs come together. And so the tree was advertising something on its menu, let's say, that was not in the kitchen. And this is like some believers today who who perhaps look like they're mature. When the wind of the Spirit blows, their leaves rustle and make a lot of noise. But when the fruit inspector, Jesus, comes looking for produce, it finds none. And so I think we need to redefine spiritual maturity in our churches, not just you know paying tithes and coming to church and being in the prayer room. And all of those things are fine. But what about redefining spiritual maturity the way Jesus defined it for example, in John 15 and in Mark chapter 11, not just being faithful to church, but what about redefining spiritual maturity as us reproducing ourselves? Let me ask you a question. When is a fruit tree mature? Is it mature when the sprig pops up out of the ground? Is it mature when uh, it has enough shade to give you a, a, a break from the, from the heat and the sun and sip a lemonade under it? No, no, no. The tree is fruitful when it, for example, if it's an apple tree, when it starts reproducing apples. And so we are not fruitful the way that I see fruitfulness in the New Testament until we start reproducing disciples just like us. Let me give you a verse to think about. It's in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. And this is what the writer said. How long do you have to be in church? And this is my paraphrase. Until you start teaching someone else. Now when we read the word teach in the New Testament, in most cases we could substitute the phrase make disciples. So the writer of Hebrews says, how long do you have to be in the church until you start teaching someone else? But then he says, because you're not teaching anyone, we cannot give you meat, but we have to feed you like a baby with just the milk of the word. And so this is a mandate for every New Testament believer to turn around and start teaching someone else. When Jesus said, go make disciples, the literal rending of this verse could be, as you go, make disciples. In other words, don't be a hero. Don't do something spectacular once a year. But every day, as you go, as you live your life every day, go make disciples. Now, to be sure, making disciples can be spiritual. 
In other words, God could poke his head through the sky, just like he did Philip, and send you out to the desert as the Ethiopian eunuch is coming by. But most disciple-making encounters are going to be as we go. Like the scripture says, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. And so God wants to direct our steps. Now, I want to talk to you and just use a little illustration about making disciples. And I want to compare two kinds of birds that uh, how they take care of their young. So let's talk about storks and penguins. Now Hans Christian Andersen is attributed uh, to the mythical, the mythical uh, made-up story of where babies come from, ostensibly to explain this question to curious children. And so the stork you know, goes to the baby cloud and it brings the baby down to the doorstep. It rings the doorbell with its beak, and then it, then it flies off. And this is sort of like how some churches do, uh, do conversion. You know, somebody gets the Holy Ghost, somebody's baptized. Well, they'll want to be back at church on Wednesday because I want to be back at church on Wednesday. You know, why don't they want to be back at church? I want to be back. But nobody's going home with them. Nobody's nurturing them. Nobody's building a relationship with them. And this is why many of our new believers fall through the cracks. And yet, on the other hand, a, a female penguin, an emperor penguin, lays her egg, then she assigns it to her husband, the father of the chick, and she goes to the water to heal and to bring back food. And she's gone for 64 days. And that male penguin is assigned to watch over that egg until the mother comes back and then the chick is hatched and then the parents spend the first 100 days with that uh, newborn to make sure that it can function, it can swim, it can find food. And this really is a picture of how the church uh, should make disciples. So I think that one of our challenges is the soul winning model. Jesus never said go win souls. He could have, but that's an Old Testament concept. It's not talking about bringing people to God. Jesus said, go make disciples. And the problem with soul winning is that when you win, it's over. You know, we baptized 12 people today. Let's go to lunch. But who's going home with those people? So this is what we're called to do. We're not called to win anything. We're called to go build relationships with lost people. As a pastor of 35 years, when I talked about soul winning through the years, I noticed this glazed look that would come into people's eyes. And it was a big turnoff because they don't have the personality, they don't have the time. But when we talk about making disciples, this is as we live our lives. Jesus is saying, go build relationships with lost people. So let me ask you a question today. How many of you have a friend? Come on, raise your hand if you have a friend. Okay, everybody's got a friend. If you don't have a friend, take more showers, brush your teeth. Come on, make friends. Okay, we need to make friends with lost people. This is what Jesus did in Matthew eleven nineteen. 19. He turned sinners into friends and friends into disciples. Now, here's what's exciting. We can reach the world. It's mathematically, theoretically possible. Listen to this. If we will stop winning souls and start making disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. If we will take one year to make one disciple, we can literally disciple the entire world in eight years. That's using 34 million oneness apostolics. If we start the penguin model and start reproducing ourselves and spending time, we can reach this world in our lifetime. Let's go make disciples.